over to Dr. Scobie. Good afternoon. Hope everyone can see me. Um, Thanks, David. We can see you on the uh, on your webcam there, and I can currently see your screen as well. All right. Well, if um, if everyone can can see this, we'll get on with it. Um, yeah, as, as Robin said, I'm I'm Scobie. Most people just call me Scobie. It's it's a lot simpler. And I want to start with some acknowledgements. So Beef Plus Lamb are the people, long enduring levy payers, paid some money for us to do a lot of this work. And Dennis O'Connell is was my right hand man for about 20 years. Um, Dennis has moved on to retirement. Now I want to step back. This is just after my grandfather came home from the First World War. So we're talking about a fair while ago. And he came across this, um, this gene variant here. I hope you can see that extra leg on the front of that animal there. And it was quite useful because it um, enabled that animal to fend off the dingoes, so predatory, predatory dogs that we have in Outback Australia. And here we are, you know, some years later, just before my dad sold the farm, and you can see all the wool that's coming in from those animals, and that shearing shed in the background was built from the proceeds in the 1950s wool boom. And things were all going swimmingly, but I hope you can see, it's not a very clear picture, but um, I'm standing in New South Wales when I took this photo looking south, and through that fence there is South Australia, and you can see the trees around the place are looking awfully bleak, and that's because these sheep learnt to reach up into the trees and pull all the branches down and kill them, and that's what led to desert formation in outback Australia. Along came this fence, and you can see this six foot high tall fence, that kept the dingoes out in South Australia, and we no longer had them in New South Wales. Now, I, that's just a, um, an opener. You don't really need to believe that whole story. But I guess the point is, you know, that, that's a long time ago, and a trait that was important then, should we use it? And then, you know, it's 100 and something years on now, and should we continue to use that? as the world changes around what we are doing on our farm. So I want to pick on another trait here. Um, and in Australia, we call these Vermont Merinos because we got from those evil sheep farmers in Vermont in America. And um, they thought that breeding sheep with these wrinkles on would give you a greater fleece weight. And that's true. They do give you a little bit more fleece, but they give you um, lower lambing percentages, they're harder to look after, they give you more variable fleece, they give you um, more death, you know, higher death rates at every single age, including in utero. They give you a tiny little bit more fleece. I know these were in America because I found a, a research paper um, around about the end of the Second World War, and you can see, I hope you can see the photo um, of the wrinkly ram on the left and the, and the plain-bodied ram on the right. And at that stage, America decided to carry on breeding sheep with plain bodies, not with those wrinkles, just because of the research and the productive, better um, lamb performance and growth rates of the plain bodied sheep. Australia did not follow that example. And very quickly, a problem emerged for us, and I don't know how serious a problem that is in Canada, but for us, it was massive. And that was these nasty little green flies would lay live maggots into the fleece of sheep, and that can kill the sheep in three days. So then in 1932, this fella called Mules came along and invented this procedure called mulesing. And, and I've actually picked up um, a note in, uh, in a letter that my grandfather sent to his sister and it said oh we're using this marvelous new technique now which um, stops fly strike and when my dad died a couple of years ago and I was going through his um, belongings and I found this letter and it, uh, maybe you can't read it but it was August the 4th 1948 
And my dad was born in 1929, so we're still a long time ago. And I've blown up just one part of it. And it, it, they'd sent him a brochure on how to undertake mulesing in 1948. So you appreciate it's now 2018. Um, he was a young man then and really keen to get on with things. We've even got some science that back in 1975, so we're getting closer now. And that's from a couple of idiots called Anson and Beasley who put this headline in a, in a science journal, Queensland Agricultural Journal, which said radical mulesing pays. And I don't expect you to read all the words on that page, but these were the main results that they came up with. All right, so we've got the percentage of fly struck sheep if you had one of those highly wrinkled animals and mules it as only 18%. But if you had a highly wrinkled sheep and it wasn't mules, 90% of them would get fly struck. That's nine in every 10 animals getting fly struck. And, you know, if you've got a couple of thousand sheep, most of those could end up dead because you would not get around to treating them. Whereas if you had an animal that was what they called lightly wrinkled and, and mules them, you get zero, but unmules they were just as good as a wrinkled sheep. And in 1975, and indeed more recently, Australians were still breeding wrinkly sheep. And they have continued to do so. You can still find quite wrinkly animals in Australia. South Africa, America, South America um, have all gone away from wrinkly sheep. New Zealand pretty much too. But um, Australia continued on with it. Now, I don't know how good this photo is. It's, it's deliberately... Um, obscured a bit here because it's an evil operation. And they're attacking that animal with a set of shears without anaesthetic. And that is what it does to the animal, right? That is a bleeding, gaping wound. I'm just going to try and slip to the webcam here and see if I can show you. So this is a set of mules and shears. It cost me $22.50 in a store here in New Zealand. And unlike normal sheep shears, it's got this bend in them so you don't, so your hands don't get in the way while you're doing this evil thing to sheep. I'll just go back to the presentation and um, carry on. Let me, let me just say, Australian Wool Innovation very recently did an experiment where they found they took large numbers of animals on large number of properties and mules them, did this evil operation to half of them and left the others. And the animals that were mules were one kilo lighter at weaning. So one kilo, that takes a kilo off their live weight at weaning, that evil operation. Um, way back in 1998, we came up with an alternative. We called this, eventually called it the low cost, easy care sheep. And we wanted to breed a sheep that had no wool on its head, no wool on its legs, no wool on its belly, no wool around its bum. So that's the important part here, is no wool around its breech. We could achieve what the um, millsing operation had done just by breeding. And then you'll see that sheep has a tiny little tail and this is, um, I've got a lifestyle block and I've got a handful of sheep myself. This is my entire yearling ewe flock, both of them, buttons and butterfly. And you can see that sheep holding its tail up. It's actually defecating, so uh, holding its tail up out of the way. And, and that's not even as short as you can breed tails. We did a, a lot of work here at, at the research farms and discovered that tail length is heritable at 0.57. Well, that's 57% heritable. And for those of you who are not really familiar with heritability, it's the variation in the offspring that you create by choosing parents. So 57% is quite her heritable. That, that is a very heritable trait. This, um, I need to acknowledge Dennis O'Connell again because I thought this was a total waste of time, but if you can look at that tail there, underneath there, there's some bare skin under the tail. And I've got a drawing here of it so we can actually see, you can see that line drawn under the bare skin under the tail. And he said about measuring that when we were measuring this other thing called tail length. And as I said, I thought it was a waste of time at the time. But turns out that bare skin under the tail is heritable also. 
And if you can keep wool away from the anus, you will reduce the amount of dag formation. We call them dags, fecal accumulation on wool. Some, some people aren't familiar with some of the Australian New Zealand terms. This is what I'm talking about. See that sheep right in the middle there? That sheep has a long tail and it's got plenty of dags stuck to it. But everybody misses the sheep that's slightly behind it, has an equally long tail and doesn't have a scrap of dags on it. And that's the kind of sheep we're looking for. And Sheep Improvement Limited is our, our national um, recording system here for um, sheep improvement. It's called Beef Plus Lamb New Zealand Genetics now. And you can see those animals or these, these drawings here. You want the animals with a zero or a one. You don't want those ones right out at the side. And they are very prone to fly strike. Turns out DAG score is not quite as heritable as these other traits. And that's probably because DAGs can be caused by a lot of things, you know, lush feed, um, infection with some microbe, uh, internal parasites, all sorts of things will cause dagginess. So the other part of heritability, this is what's created by genetics, but the other 80% is caused by environment. So in tail length, most of it's caused by genetics and a little bit's caused by environment. And so here's a photo of a sheep with pretty much the package. So we've got this tiny little tail and if you look carefully, you can see a thumbnail just, just disappearing off the side of that diamond screen holding that tail out so we can get a picture of the back end of that sheep. And I'm not a particularly religious person, but you can see some light being shone down on that sheep to identify that that's a good one. So we can keep that sheep. That bareness of the breech is heritable at 45%. So again, that's, that's a really good heritability. You can see the um, tails at birth, and then you can see this trait at weaning, and so by the time you wean the animals, you know which ones you want to keep. You know which ones you're going to send away for slaughter. Just what does this do for you? So we've got pictures of bareness along the bottom here. This is physically pictures of bareness. And you see the animal um, that is a, um, a woolly backside there. We actually had to create a clean animal. I had to go through with our bare hands and crush all the dags off it and try and brush them off and you can still see traces there because it's hard to find an animal that isn't daggy when they have a woolly bum. Right over to the other side you can see no dags accumulating on that animal. Not a great, you know, if you look up the y-axis it's not a, a huge dag score. Um, it varies right up to five but here we're less than one on average but all of those woolly bums had dags. Take it up to a larger scale. This was out on a farm. On this farm, the um, perindoles that you can see in the solid dots were bred by the guy that we went to. He was running an organic farm and he had inherited his perindole flock from his father. And then he had a bunch of composites that he bred by crossing those perindoles with other things. And we went in and did bareness score of his entire flock. And then we went away and found the sires of those animals. And so each one of these dots is the mean of at least 30 progeny. So each one of those dots, so if you look out the side here, about three and a half, 30 progeny went into each of those dots. It tells you less than half a unit of DAG score on an environment, you know, which is quite challenging. It's a, um, a organic environment. So those lambs before weaning are plagued by internal parasites. And you can see those perindoles, they grew all right and they did all right in this environment, but they were a lot daggier than the composites and largely because they had, the composites had bare bums. So breech bareness, there's, there's no argument about this, it just gives you less dags. It also reduces the amount of fly strike. Now fly strike is a difficult experiment to, to work on. Because every time you set up a fly strike experiment, you don't get any fly strike that summer. Uh, we were um, sitting at home one Christmas break and the farm manager rang me and he said, the weather's terrible, there's fly strike everywhere, get down here. So my technician and I raced off and we recorded fly strike in our research flock and got these results. So you can see fly strike decreasing as we get bearer bums. In fact, we went out to commercial farms to do a lot of our work 
um, like you saw from that Perindale and Composite flock. And we found that animals with bear breeches were five times less fly stroke, less likely to get fly stroke than on commercial farms. So you might have noticed if you saw the webcam picture of me, I've left the lights off in here because I don't like the way the lights make my hair look white. That was me a long, long time ago bending over the sheep. You can see I had darker hair then. That's me trying to point out an udder on a standard New Zealand Romney U. Somewhere in there, there must be teats, and a lamb has to find those teats. I want to also just, I'll flip back to the webcam here and make sure I'm. So, this is a shearing comb. I'll try and get the light on it a bit. And, you know, if that's a used teat, it'll fit in here and get cut while someone is trying to trying to shear that belly of that animal. And that's where you start. You start shearing there. And we get, you know, pretty good shearers, but they still knock these udders around, and that affects lemming percentage. This sheep here. So, so that sheep there took 150 seconds to shear. This sheep here, 68 seconds to shear that animal because you don't have to start on the belly. You don't go near the udder with that handpiece to do any damage. And again, a little bit of light shining on that animal. There's some sound effects there. I'll try and talk over this. Um, that shearer, starts on the back leg here. He doesn't have to start on the belly. That ewe is close to lambing. That udder um, safe from his handpiece. And the other point about this, for us, it's really important. You could run a four-stand shed with one person collecting the fleeces and sticking them in that press. If you've got woolly bellies and woolly legs and all that, then you have to get at least two, maybe three wool handlers to pull all the parts of the fleece off that you don't want, all the dags and urine stains and bellies. Um, head pieces and um, chuck them into different bales. Whereas if you've just got a fleece like that, you can just whip the fleece off and chuck it into a bale. Heritability of that trait, again, it's really good, 31%. That's at weaning. So for bear bellies, that's at weaning. We know it's better when they're adult ewes. So when they're um, 18 months old, you get a lot better um, bearing on what those ewes are going to do for the rest of their life. Now, this trait was not one we went looking for. It was handed to us as a gift just because of the um, work we were doing with the breeds that we were using. And you can see that little white patch at the top of that animal's tail. Well, I've just plucked the feathers out of that animal. Um, and they come out quite easily. Just, just finger pressure will do it. And um, that whole tail will shed a wool, and of course, it's just like shearing them, and some of that it wool around their breech will pull out as well, and it's like crutching them. Now, we've really only recently published a first draft of what this um, does. We know that this trait is controlled by a small number of genes, so heritability estimates are not really that good for um, traits that are governed by a small number of genes. They're, they're too lumpy. We generally use heritability estimates for quantitative traits, but it is heritable. So you can put this trait onto your flock of sheep, even if you have really long tails. We bred it onto Romney sheep with really long tails, really woolly tails, and then coming into the spring, they would shed the wool off their entire tail. Take the dags with it. So these are the the, the breeding goal that we, we think um, we'd like to see spread all across the world. You know, one of the reasons I'm bringing in this here today. Just breed them with a genetically short tail, a bare breech, a bare belly, bare head, bare legs, no dags. So you don't have to go near them with a handpiece. Just once a year to take that fleece off. And... They'll reward you with no fly strike. And the only trait that has, um, it's affected Australians' decision about whether they would like to go with these traits, uh, and that is fleece weight. So they feel as though they're losing about 300 or 400 grams of wool off the belly and a little bit off the legs and half a kilo of fleece um, is worth about 
six dollars in Australia. Uh, half a kilo of fleece here is worth about one dollar New Zealand because it's all crossbred fleece. And you remember my facetious example, things change. You know, the price of all has changed. The price of shearing has changed and we've had to reassess whether we want to do these things or whether we want to have a sheep that has some wool on it to keep it warm in the winter, whip it off during the summer so it doesn't get fly strike. And we've changed um, a few people's minds in, a, in New Zealand and even fewer in Australia about what a sheep should look like. So that's all I had in terms of a presentation. I'm prepared to answer a few questions if you like. Great, thanks so much, um, Scobie. I have two questions that have already come in, so I'll give everybody else on the line the opportunity now to ask some more questions while we go through the ones I have already. So the first one I have is, which traits trump others? For example, barrenness versus fertility. Um, a ewe produces a single with great characteristics. Is that a keeper? Is that a call? Or do you search out sheep that hold all characteristics, even if you have to go off farm? That's an easy one. For us, Bearness trumps everything else because it costs you about $2 to get a sheep crutched. And a lot of our farmers have to do it two and three times a year. And a kilo of wool, that's all gone. So you shear it once and crutch it twice and you've lost about um, $6 worth of um, wool. You could have saved all that simply by shearing. So for us, Bearness is of the breach is just number one. Um, go for that. Now I did mention there were no adverse correlations, and that was only with fleece weight. But bareness of the belly, bareness of the legs, and bareness of the head is actually correlated with increased reproduction. So both number of lambs born and number of lambs weaned improves in bare-headed animals. Um, but that's been demonstrated all over New Zealand. I really don't know what it'll be like in your um, environment. But one of the reasons is those lambs, when they're born in our environment, out in the field in spring, they can get hold of the teat easier. They're like a heat seeking device and they will find that belly and then they will rummage around and find the teat. If they've got a ewe that's got a wet belly and it's all covered in wool, it takes them a long time to find the teat. And they often end up with a mouthful of wool and lambing percentages are down. Okay, great. Second question here is, without fleece around the udder or belly, is it still imperative to shear pregnant ewes? No, uh, I'm not a fan of shearing pregnant ewes myself. I realize that it um, has some advantages in uh, other environments. It does make our ewes seek shelter and tend to have lambs in shelter and that's better for them. But, um, I've never been pregnant myself, but it doesn't look, you know, especially with late pregnant ewes, it doesn't look like a fantastic um, thing to be doing to a late pregnant animal. A lot of our, um, um, a lot of work done at Massey University suggested it should be 100 days before lambing, and I'm still not a favour of it. You know, we're ending up with um, a lot of rainfall. It's very cold at that time of year. You need to manage those animals very carefully. And there are better ways. A lot of farmers use it just so they can see what condition their ewes are in, how much um, live weight they've got on them, and whether they need to feed them more. And I just think there are better ways of doing that. Okay, great. Another question here is when breeding for next to skin quality fiber, such as blue faced lasters, how easy is it to breed these traits in? Um, we went to a border Leicester farm, which has a similar sort of wool, perhaps a bit coarser than your um, English Leicester and Blue Face Leicester. Um, Blue Face Leicester have lovely bare um, heads and legs. So there are a lot of those luster type wools with bare heads and legs. And strangely, in New Zealand, the um, stud book says you should not have animals that strip. So anything that loses a wool off its belly or its neck get chucked out of studs and border lesters and cheviots as well. And I just can't see the sense in that myself. It's just a, a trait that um, because they have to have bare legs and bare heads in their selection, because that's what a cheviot 
and a, a Borderlester should look like. You bring along these traits for bare bellies and then you just keep chucking them out all the time because bare bellied animals appear. Um, we've seen uh, bare bellies, bare legs in and bare heads in animals with fibre diameters down to 17 micron in some of our feral um, and merino crossbreds that we were selecting for these same traits. You can put any sort of fibre you want onto these animals. Okay. Um, another question here. Here in Canada, we have some very cold winters and our ewes often winter out. Do you think breeding for a bare belly will affect the winter hardiness of our ewes, thus increasing feed costs? That's a really interesting question for me to answer. In our New Zealand environment, we've actually found that they are better off with a bare belly. And during my PhD studies, I discovered that um, those weird animals that live in South America, the camelids, so the alpaca and the Juanaco and those sorts of things, they actually have bare um, patches underneath their armpits, you know, in the axilla, because when they run away up a hill away from something that's frightened them, if they've got this covering of, you know, alpaca fleece is quite nice for holding the, the heat in, but once they get hot, they don't want to cook inside. They have to have these windows to let the heat out. And they'll do that, radiate that heat from under their armpits. Um, I understand your winters are pretty savage, but ours were better off without the wool on the belly because they'll lie down in snow. They'll get stuck to that snow. They'll pick up a lot of uh, mud and a lot of wet wool underneath there. They're actually better off having no wool at all because they can stand up and dry. When you're talking about the serious cold that you guys get in the winter time, it's still an interesting question. I've had a lot of people ask me if those ewes will get frostbite if their ears are sticking out. But you must be able to find Suffolk breeders or Border Leicester breeders or someone like that in Canada who can answer those questions for you. Okay, I've got one more question here, so I'm just going to give a reminder to everyone on the line here that um, this will be another chance to um, type in your question here. Um, okay, so this question is, do you think getting away from tail docking will increase consumer confidence? Absolutely. I mean, what I said at the start and about how mulesing, mulesing is completely unacceptable to consumers and Australian producers need to get with the project and get on with it someday and I don't know whether that'll be in my lifetime or after um, but one day tail docking will be banned. Mulesing is banned in New Zealand now in 2018. I was part of the National Animal Welfare Advisory Committee that made that decision and so it's in legislation for this year. Tail docking we discussed at length and a lot of our breeds of sheep have still got these woolly tails and a lot of people don't you know they, they get a lot of dags um, also the, the slaughter plants have pro problems with daggy tails and, and long tails that cause carcass contamination but at some stage in the future consumers will start demanding that sheep aren't docked you know they see them in little nursery rhymes when they're kids leave them alone and they'll come home wagging their tails behind them then you look at an adult sheep and you go well where did that go Okay, another question came in here. If New Zealand has perfected the easy care sheep to consistently produce animals with the bare areas indicated by Dr. Scobie, will these genetics be available to other countries, for example, Canada? Yep, we have exported some uh, to Australia. Um, Meat and Livestock Australia um, got hold of some of our um, semen from some of our rams. Um, Ag research does not have any of these left. We we sold out. So once you know, our job is just research. So once we'd finished the research project, we sold all the animals, and they are in the hands of a number of breeders throughout New Zealand. And I'm sure a lot of those would be happy to export genetics. But I would like to encourage you to look amongst the animals that you have. It's really quite surprising. We found bare breeches in. 13 different breeds and about seven different composite strains all across New Zealand. It's just that people had either actively selected against them or just didn't concentrate on that trait. 
So have a look around in what you've got available in Canada first before you start um, looking overseas. Everybody always, you know, thinks, oh, it's got to be something better in the world. I've got to bring it in. It's expensive. It brings diseases with it. And sometimes, you know, this, the breeds that you've got adapted to your own environment will be a lot better. Okay, looks like that's all the questions that I have um, received right now. Uh, I see there's a couple slides after your question box, Scobie. I'm not sure if you had anything else to add or... I kind of... Um, those are about fleece weights. Um, so I'm going to minimise that and pull that up again. Um, so these are the border lesters I was talking about. This was the stud flock that we went through and anything with... A, there wasn't... Um, any uh, yearling rams, they'd got rid of all the ram, yearling rams that had really bare bellies because that's not in their selection, you know, what they're allowed to register in a, as a stud. But as yearlings, you can see the decline in fleece weight. And this, what is it, uh, 28, so 0.28, 280 grams, a quarter of a kilogram of Bordelester wool, which is currently worth about 50 cents. And you can see the Coopworths and the Romneys showing this similar trend. But we, in, our, in the flocks that we looked at, we couldn't find any with a bare score of three in the Romney animals. Um, yearling ewes the same. We've um, got some composites there. They did, that reduced wool production by 700 grams. Again, it's not worth a lot of money. It costs you money to get it taken off. And if you're getting more lambs from a, an animal with bare belly, why wouldn't you go that way? And this just shows the same thing in adult use of our composite flock where we could see, and we didn't actually see animals with woolly bellies, but we could see a range of animals. And there's a decent number of animals in each of those belly scores. I just can't remember what it was now, but we had um, at least 50 ewes in each of those belly scores, I think. We had about 300 records in the um, flock each year. So at least... Um, 50 ewes in that two score. We generally culled against those. And you can see um, their wool production dropping, but interestingly, their live weight increased to the score five. And yeah, you have to believe me that lambing percentage went up as live weight went up. And that's nothing to do with our, our experimental work. It's just heavier ewes have more lambs. I don't want to encourage people to have of enormous sheep. I realise there's some pretty big ones in America. I've seen them and stood by them and they're quite frightening. I can't think how I would turn one upside down and try to shear it. The biggest one I've heard of here in New Zealand was 146 kilograms, which has a 40 kilogram advantage over me and I'm a big guy. But I still don't think I could have turned that pole dorset ram upside down and survived the fight with him. And we have shearers here that can shear, you know, two and three hundred sheep a day. And if you're dragging a hundred kilo sheep across the boards, that's a fair job. We had a, a woman shearing, or two women shearing down at the research flock, and we served them up um, a ewe that was over a hundred kilos, a two tooth ewe that was over a hundred kilos. And this poor shearer, she would have been lucky to be 70 kilos ringing with sweat. And so that it's just not a fair fight. Um, so I'm not a huge fan of increasing live weights indefinitely. You do get better production out of, out of bigger animals. It's not a correlation with our traits that we've been talking about. It did, didn't seem to be genetically correlated in our flock. But as those animals reach this, um, this age, for some reason they were doing better. Land production was better correlated. That's the last of those slides there. Um, look, I've become an enormous fan of these traits. Um, my own personal flock and the research flock that I looked at for years and years had long tails. And I came to think of them as the norm and I'd walk around other people's farms. I think, oh, that's right. Everybody else stocks their sheep. It's just something you need to get out of your head when we handed the, um, the research flock back to the farm before they sold them. I would go over at tail docking time and the farm manager would be cutting tails off and going, oh, I don't know why I'm doing this, but I'm still doing it. And he would cut all the tails off these sheep that had tails about this long. They didn't need their tails cut off, 
but it was just something in his headspace that made him want to do that. Okay, if you're willing, um, let's go. We have one more question that came in. Um, and the question is, how does wool in dairy ewes work in New Zealand? Sorry? Uh, how does wool in dairy ewes work in New Zealand? Ah, that's interesting. Dairy sheep are not big here in New Zealand, though we do have a couple of big flocks. But I ran across a guy just the other day who was in the foyer of a um, one of our boutique cheese factories using dairy sheep milk. And he said he couldn't get enough milk and he wanted to expand his flock four times to supply just this one little boutique cheese factory. And he said he wished he'd bought our flock. And I said, mate, we didn't select, and it's not the first time I've had this discussion with him. I said, we didn't select those sheep for milk production. We just did what was important to lambs to New Zealand at the time. We started in 1998, which was lambs and wool. Milk production is a new thing. You know, it's 2014 before people even started becoming seriously interested in it. I said, we didn't have milk production in our index. And he said, look, I because I'm milking, because I need that hygiene, I have to have a handpiece run over these sheep a lot during the milking season. It's only a short season. And it's frustrating to him. And he said he wished he'd bought our whole flock so he could get those traits for bareness into his dairy sheep so they wouldn't have to spend money on crutching and, and belly shearing those ewes just for the um, hygiene of his milk. Okay, perfect. So it looks like uh, no other questions have come in, um, but I think this has been a, a really interesting discussion. So I guess at this point, um, Scobie, I'll just take the opportunity to really thank you for being available to uh, speak to our producers here in Alberta, Canada, all the way from New Zealand. Um, we really do appreciate it. And, uh, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. I understand it's just about 10 o'clock there. So you've got the whole day ahead of you on Thursday and uh, it's afternoon here, almost two o'clock. So um, everyone else will be starting to make dinner. <laughs> Yeah, well, can I, um, yeah, uh, thank you for inviting me. And Robin, you'll have my email address. And if anybody um, didn't get a chance to ask questions or that, just, just forward your questions by email. I'm happy to answer those. Um, yeah, I'll get an answer back to you by the time you wake up the next day, probably. Um, really good talking to you. Thanks very much. Great. Thanks so much. We really appreciate it. Bye now. Cheers. <laughs>